Welcome everyone to our seventh joint session of uh, the e um, Early Text Cultures uh, Seminar on Astronomy and Astrology. Today's afternoon session is entitled Naming and Nomenclature, and we are going to listen to interesting papers by Bartninkas, Vilius Bartninkas and Federico Valenti on uh, Greek and uh, Chinese uh, planetary and uh, astrological uh, related uh, terms, uh, nomenclature. Without further ado, I am very pleased to introduce uh, our first uh, speaker, Dr. Vilius Bartninkas, who is a postdoctoral fellow at uh, Vilnius University. He defended his uh, doctoral thesis uh, which is entitled Traditional Gods and Civic Religion in Plato's Later Dialogues at the University of Cambridge in 2019. He currently teaches courses on political theory and ancient philosophy, and his research interests explore the interaction between religion, cosmology, and morality in Plato's works. So without further ado, please, Vilius, audience is yours. Please uh, unmute yourself and start sharing your screen. Please, everyone, mute your mics so as not to disturb our speaker. Audience. Thank you. Okay, so I will, I will start sharing my, my screen. It's such a pleasure to be here today with you, especially because this is an inter interdisciplinary seminar and I'm really interested in knowing more about uh, some fields that I'm not really familiar. And of course, they're every, everything apart from, from Plato. Um, as mentioned, uh, I am mainly interested in Plato's conception of traditional Greek gods and their relation with the cosmic gods who are the stars and planets and who, and who are the key objects of theological investigation in Plato's later works. One general trend of Plato's later thought is that he seems to merge some of the traditional gods with the cosmic gods. And it is precisely here that the question about the names of planets first arise. And more generally, I mean, uh, everyone knows the names of planets here around the globe, right? And I was, I was really interested in, in, in the origins of, of, of this naming procedure, right? And it, it's a quite interesting set of gods, right? So we have Aphrodite, we have Zeus, we have Hermes. And I'm, I was, my, my research really started with trying to find the roots of all of it. And I will try to share my, my, uh, my latest find, findings. Okay, so our first passage is from Plato's Timaeus, where the creator god, whom Plato calls the Demurge, makes the younger gods, one of whom receives a name from the Olympian family. Let me read the passage for you. This is text one. When the god had finished making a body for each of them, he placed them in the orbits traced by the period of the different, seven bodies and seven orbits. He set the moon in the first circle around the earth and the sun in the second, above it. The dawn bearer and the star said to, said to be sacred to Hermes, he said to run in circles that equal the sun's in speed, though they received the power contrary to its power. As a result, the sun, the star of Hermes and the dawn bearer alike overtaken are overtaken by one another. As for the other bodies, if I were to spell out where he situated them and all his reasons for doing so, my account already at aggression would make more work than it, its purpose calls for. As this and some other passages indicate, Plato knows pre the precise number of planets, which is five. But he does not distribute the divine name systematically. In fact, only one star is called Hermes. But even here, some uncertainty remains. He uses a genitive to indicate the name, and this raises a further complication concerning the relation between the Olympian god and the cosmic entity. Are the two identical, uh, whereby the god is the planet? Or alternatively, does the star merely belong to a different god who is Hermes, right? So is it a relation of identity or a relation of possession? The passage cannot resolve this issue, nor the dialogue itself. A similar problem can be found in another Plato's dialogue, The Laws, which offers to institute a new cult of Apollo Helios, and this is text two. I read, every year after summer solstice, the whole city is to meet on the sacred ground 
which is common to Helios and Apollo, with a view to presenting free men from among themselves to the god. The context here is somewhat different, especially because here a cosmic god already has a traditional name, Helios, but now he's merged with another traditional god, Apollo. The singular theos in this passage seems to point to an identity type of relation rather than a relation of possession. But again, we cannot be certain because uh, he does not speculate more about, uh, about the ontological status of this god. What the two passages show, however, is that Plato began to discuss the relation between the cosmic and traditional gods by assigning the names of Olympian gods to the cosmic deities. Now, he did not uh, provide a systematic account of this, so we do not have a full, uh, a full list of uh, cosmic gods with traditional names. And that is why we have to move one generation further into the old academy where Plato's students worked. We now turn to the eponymous. Uh, okay, we now turn to the eponymous, uh, which is a pseudoplatonic work that survives in Plato's corpus. Scholars generally agree that it belongs to Plato's secretary, Philippopoulos, who was an astronomer and who also worked on theology. And we are about to see that this Plato student went further with assigning the traditional names than Plato. I read text three. The morning star, which is also the evening star, is accounted as Aphrodite's star, a name highly appropriate for a Syrian lawgiver to choose. The star that more or less accompanies both the sun and Aphrodite is Hermes. We have yet to speak of three more orbits that move to the right like the moon and the sun. But we should mention one, the eighth, which above all should be called cosmos. Of the remaining three stars, one is particularly slow and some call it by the name Kronos. The next slowest we should call Zeus. And the next one, Aries. This one has the reddest color of them all. Now this text is one of the earliest texts that provide a complete list of cosmic gods with particular names and features precisely our five familiar cosmic gods that we all know, Hermes, Aphrodite, Aries, Zeus, and Kronos. It is interesting to know that the realm of the fixed stars is treated, unlike in Plato, as a single entity and called cosmos. Uh, the fixed stars does not receive a, a traditional name. Once again, notice the genitives here, which indicates the problem that I already mentioned about the relation between the two families. But what is new about this passage is that uh, the knowledge of names is derived from a foreign source, the anonymous Syrian lawgiver, whoever he is. And so um, the author suggests that it was not the academy that invented the names of the gods, but someone else. However, such an inscription is missing in another uh, contemporary list that survives in another Plato's student, Aristotle, who discusses the differences between Eudoxus and Calypso's astronomical models. Let me read text four. And the poles of the third sphere are different from the other planets in Eudox's astronomical model, but those of Aphrodite and Hermes are the same. Calypso made the position of the spheres the same as Eudoxus did, but while he assigned the same number as Eudoxus did to Zeus and Kronos, he thought two more spheres should be added to the sun and two to the moon, if we were to explain the phenomena, and one more uh, to each of the other planets. So we have here four names. Aries is missing. But Aristotle knew him as well, as we know from his other work, the Chilo. Surely it is not Aristotle who came up with this list, but Eudoxus, who was probably the most famous astronomer in Plato's circle, or, his, or Eudoxus sources. We cannot be certain about that. And so we now have at least two candidates uh, for naming, for the original uh, naming of gods. So the Syrian lawgiver, the anonymous figure, and Eudoxus, or someone else in the academy. These four passages now have at least three problems. First, who was responsible for distributing the names of the planets? Is it an invention of the academy or was it really drawn from some other source? Second, what was the method of distribution? The five names are quite familiar to us, but if we look at them from the perspective of Greek religion, they become more puzzling. These are surely not the greatest gods, and we cannot really see immediately some sort of a connection between them, right, or some, some order or whatever. So why, for example, Hermes and not Apollo? Why Ares and not Bacchus? And especially why Kronos, who is an outcast in the religious system? Finally, there is the question about the ontology of naming. And this is, of course, the question about, uh, about what kind of relation we envisage uh, between the traditional and cosmic gods. So does this procedure intend to merge the two families 
or does it retain some sort of distance between them? Due to our time limit, I won't be able to explore this last question in the presentation, but I can comment on it during the discussion time. The most influential attempt to answer this, these questions belong to a very old article by Franz Cumont. He has argued that these five Greek names correspond to the Babylonian gods, which were transmitted to the academy through the Pythagoreans. In particular, he claimed that these five identifications were carried out on the functional basis, meaning the qualities and character patterns of the Greek gods correspond to their Babylonian counterparts. And the specific translation was the following. I used the Babylonian names from Cumont's paper. So Nabu became Hermes, Ishtar, Aphrodite, Nergal, Paris, Marduk, Zeus, Ninurta, Kronos. In the remaining of my presentation, my aim is to raise some doubts concerning Kumon's thesis. It is very much a work in progress, so I do not have a fully uh, concocted alternative interpretation, nor do I think that it is uh, possible to fully, uh, uh, to fully disprove Kumon, or in fact to prove him right. We have very limited sources. Still, I want to show that some of elements in his thesis are fundamentally flawed. So let us begin with the first element, the Pythagorean uh, transmission. It is true that the Pythagoreans are usually credited with the first correct description of the planetary positions in, in Greek thought, as text five shows us. More importantly, text six adds a crucial, a crucial piece of information, which is the number of planets. I read, for the sun, they, the Pythagoreans say, moves after the sphere of the fixed stars, uh, and after the five spheres of the planets. After it is the moon, eighth, the, and the earth, ninth, and after the earth, the counter earth. The problem with this evidence is that it neither mentions the names of, of planets nor the fact that the Pythagoreans were the translators of the Babylonian names into Greek. And we must not presume that the correct identification of the position and number of astral bodies necessarily led to distribution of names, because there are examples where a certain philosopher identifies the planets by their positions or even colors without giving them a religious name. And a good example is Plato himself in his middle dialogue, The Republic which is your text seven, right? So there are no uh, traditional names there, only colors. The Pythagorean transmission becomes even more problematic if we look at the evidence on the Pythagorean astronomer presumably responsible for the identification of correct positions. This is Philolaus, perhaps the most uh, famous astronomer in the Pythagorean circles. In text eight, Philolaus is reported to have distributed planets around the central cosmic fire, which was titled the House of Zeus. Uh, this is yet another testimony which speaks of the position of planets without giving them names. In addition, it shows that Philolaus has a relatively different strategy for using the names of traditional gods. Instead of associating Zeus with some planet, he gives the name Zeus to the main cosmological entity. So it eliminates at least one direct planetary link with the Babylonian gods. In other testimonies, Philolaus is credited with giving other names of traditional gods to various mathematical items and cosmological principles, but never to planets and stars. And this is your text nine, where two of our planets, Kronos and Aries, are actually these mathematical cosmological principles. So we can be certain that Philolaus did not assign the same planetary names that we have in the Epinomis. And in light of this evidence, the Pythagorean part of Kumon's thesis seems to be somewhat dubious. So it is safer to rely on the existing evidence and presume that the distribution of names to planets and stars began with Plato and was completed by the first generation students, Eudoxus or someone else there. Now, let us examine the method of naming. Although the Pythagorean uh, piece uh, of, of thesis may, may not be right, but we still have this Kumon's table of translation where Nabu becomes Hermes, Ishtar Aphrodite, where one god becomes another god in virtue of some shared quality. I'm no expert of Babylonian theology, so my, my argument is <laughs> purely speculative and any insight into their theology would be really ex extremely welcome. But still I'm puzzled about these associations because I cannot see a nice functional correspondence between the two systems. Of course, Ishtar is the best example for Kumon because she is associated with love and beauty, just like Aphrodite's key areas of activity. But the rest of them do not have such a neat correspondence. 
And some of them, like Kronos and Myrta, have a vague similarity, if any at all. But even if Kumon is right uh, about the translation, we know that later there were competing lists of names, which raised more questions about the so-called functional correspondence. In Pseudo Aristotle's De Mundo, we find the following information, and, and this work is Hellenistic work. So text 10, I read. The position nearest to the sphere is occupied by the, by the so-called circle of the shining star, or Kronos. Next is that of the beaming star, which, is, which also bears the name of Zeus. Then follows the circle of the fiery star, called by the names both of Heracles and of Ares. Next comes the glistening star, which some call sacred to Hermes, others sacred to Apollo. After that is the circle of the light-bearing star, which some call the star of Venus, others the star of Hera, and so on. So the passage reports Apollo, Hera, and Heracles as an alternative to Hermes, Aphrodite, and Ares, respectively. It does not invalidate the bit in Kumon's thesis about the translation, because these names can also be regarded as translations, right? But it at least shows that there may be different strategies in handling the names, which is also confirmed by the fact that you can uh, differentiate uh, this, the, the stars and planets according to their luminosity. But even so, if Ishtar can become either Aphrodite or Hera, it means that the functional correspondence between the two families is vague at best. And it also invites to speculate a bit more about whether there can be alternative explanations concerning the origins of these names. Well, first, why to give names at all? Why the Platonists were concerned with giving the names uh, to planets? We can uncover the reasoning behind Philip's list, and, and I think that this holds uh, of every Platonist. So he's motivated to spell out the particular names of each planet because it restores the equality among the cosmic gods, and especially in relation to the traditional gods, since some of them were not known, and this allows assigning them a proper share of religious honors. So this project of naming the gods is deeply religious. By giving the names, philosophers express their piety. Second, uh, what was the method that guided the procedure of naming the gods in the academy? I return to the text three and four, uh, Aristotle and Philip, and we can see here that they abstain from explicitly stating it. They do not mention the Greek names originated as translations. Of course, the so-called Syrian lawgiver is a convenient figure for Kumon to assume that there is an older tradition behind the Platonist project of naming the stars, but we must not rely too heavily on such a piece of information because it is typical of Plato and his students to invent an older and foreign tradition, usually Egyptian, to support claims concerning the origins of institutions, practices, and knowledge. The Atlantis story is a good example, but there are many more in Plato's later works. So just because we see similarities between Greek and Babylonian gods, it does not mean that the Platonists actually worked with the Babylonian names. Third, is there any example of a naming procedure apart from Eudoxus and Philip in the writings of Plato's students? And the answer is positive. Some of the academics seem to have made the attempts at formulating such a systematic principle, which is well illustrated by Xenocrates, who is a very famous Plato student. He was, uh, he was a, a further head of the academy after, after, after Plato. So let me read text 11. Xenocrates of Chalcedon, son of Agathonor, claims that the monad and the diet are gods. These are the main principles in, 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 in his system. The former as male having the role of father, ruling in the Uranos, whom he calls Zeus, odd and intellect, which is his first god. The latter is female in the sense of mother of, of the gods, ruling over the sphere under the Uranos, which is his soul of the universe. He claims that Uranos is a god, and the fiery stars are the Olympian gods, and the others are the invisible sublunary, sublunary demons. He also believes that the latter penetrate the material elements as well. Of these, he calls the unseen Hades, the one which permits the water, Poseidon, and the one which permits the earth, Demeter, seed solar. The origins of these spheres he adapted from Plato and then supplied to the Stoics. For almost every divinity in his system, Xenocrates gives a corresponding name that comes from the religious tradition. Thus, the monad becomes Zeus, the universe becomes Uranus, and the elements uh, become various additional gods. We must suppose that the progression of these names reflect the function of the gods rather than their position in Greek theogonies. The senior gods of Xenocrates' universe are not matched with the senior gods of Greek theogony, 
for that would amount to making Uranos or Kronos and not Zeus the most prominent deity. Instead, Xenocrates seems to allocate traditional identities on a functional basis. For instance, the governing principle of the universe receives the name of the king of, of gods, Zeus, while the aquatic aspect of the universe is identified with a god of seas, Poseidon. So the functional description of names that Kumon mentioned is much clearer in Xenocrates than in any other academic. And this is how a functional correspondence should look like. And we, when we come back to the, to the epinomis, again, it seems that, there's not, that this dialogue does not use a single method of naming the gods. So given that the Syrian lawgiver may be just a rhetorical figure, and given that on its own, the list has no clear system of names, can we find an alternative explanation of these names? And I think that we can. A number of local explanations can throw some light on the specific theological identities in text three. One of Philip's sources of inspiration is probably the passage that we already mentioned. This is text seven, where each planet is characterized by a distinguishing color and luminosity. Philip may have reinterpreted this passage as suggesting that a given astral color has a symbolical meaning. On this reading, one may conjecture that Aries received the reddest planet because the color red is quite appropriate for the blood-soaked god of war, which is a conventional way of describing him in poetry, and this is your text well. I think that similar local explanations can, found, uh, can be found for both Aphrodite and Hermes. The religious identity of the planet can be determined not only by color, like, like Aries was, but also by its intensity and aesthetical appeal. Thus, Aphrodite received, of course, the brightest and the most beautiful star. And this link between a compar the comparable qualities of a god and a planet is applicable to Hermes as well. His name is a takeover from text one, where Hermes planned is singled out for its speed. And in addition, our text three identifies this plant as a travel companion to Aphrodite and Helios. And both qualities of the plant are in harmony with the conventional areas of Hermes activity, namely traveling and quickness. As for Kronos and Zeus, they are associated with, uh, with slowness in text three. And so far, I have not found a good reason why these plants receive these particular names, which is why it's still a work in progress. Um, let me gather some conclusions, which are very tentative. Now, the wider implication of my analysis is that it is, I want to show that it is misleading to think that the members of the old academy unanimously collapse the distinction between the traditional and cosmic gods. It is Xenocrates, as we saw, who offered a wholesale reinterpretation of traditional gods. He was the one to establish the functional correspondence between the two families and to allocate the religious names accordingly. In this way, he dissolved the distinction between the traditional and other kinds of gods. Philip's arrangement, on the other hand, is not so tidy. He makes a provocative and an ambiguous proposal to call the cosmic gods by the names of the traditional gods, but then he does not adopt a single method in distributing their names. In addition, I think that Kumon's thesis is not as sound as it is usually regarded. I hope to have shown that the Pythagorean line is flawed to the, to the, due to the evidence that we have. They simply, the Pythagoreans, do not distribute the traditional names to planets. As for the particular method of naming the gods in the old academy, we enter more speculative waters. Kumon's thesis on the translation from the Babylonian is still quite persuasive, but we can find more economic explanations as well. So my idea is the following. There may be a link between the qualities of the Babylonian gods who are planets and their counterparts in the Greek systems, even if it is a vague uh, link. But these very qualities can be found when examining the qualities of planets themselves in relation to the qualities of the respective gods. So the given names may reflect the impressions that arose from the astronomical observations rather than being outcomes of translation. However, we may resolve this question, it is at least clear that our main material are the first generation philosophers in Plato's Academy and their decision to build a cosmic pantheon as a way to show their, their respect and piety to the stars and planets. Thank you. Thank you, Vilius, for this fascinating paper. So uh, now I will give uh, the turn to our second speaker and then leave the discussion at the end of both uh, papers. So, uh, Thank you, Vilius, again. And uh, now let me present uh, our second 
speaker, who is Federico Valenti, who received a bachelor degree in foreign languages and literatures at the University of Bologna, and then a master in Asian and North African studies at Ca Foscari in Venice. He defended his PhD thesis at the University of Sassari in 2018, uh, a thesis who deals uh, with uh, biological classification in early Chinese dictionaries and glossaries. Now is currently um, a lecturer in Chinese language and culture at his uh, former high school after being uh, a Jingbuan scholar at the Needham Research Institute at the University of Cambridge. His main research interests are Chinese philology, lexicography, and etymology. And now he's going to give to us an interesting paper relating with a uh, uh, treatise, the Shi Tian, if I'm pronouncing it correctly, on uh, planetary nomenclature. So please, Federico. Audience is yours, please unmute yourself and... Okay, thank you very much. And uh, thank you also my, my fellow um, <clears throat> uh, speaker, Vilius, because he steered my cur curiosity towards uh, Gre ancient Greek nomenclature. And somehow I was smiling because some of his topics, uh, 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 we, can, we, can, we can still find some of this like planned nomenclatures in my, in my talk as well. So um, let's start. Uh, let's start by clarifying that I'm, as as Adalberto said, I'm not an expert on astronomy. I'm more uh, fond of biology. But 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 uh, my, my my the text the text that I like the most in 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 ancient Chinese literature is a sort of dictionary. Ancient dictionary is called the Arya, and this Arya, like as a sort of like dictionary or encyclopedia has both like biological chapters, but also astronomical chapters. So uh, my topic of today will be on that chapter, which is called the Shi Tian, so to explain the heavens. So I will just go very fast because a lot of people <laughs> that already uh, listen to my presentation already know um, what the aria is but i will uh, introduce it like uh, as fast as i as possible now so the aria is traditionally dated to uh, the uh, thousand bce but probably is like a um, a rather uh, more modern text probably uh, between the third and the second century uh, uh, bce and so there are a lot of different kind of uh, datations so we can say that this text is a sort of like he has a, a lot of strata so we have like a very very ancient chapters like the first chapters are very ancient and there are um, more modern uh, chapters uh, by the end of it and especially the thematic chapters so for example the i will i will show you in uh, um in a couple of seconds what i'm talking about like this is like what does Arya mean? So uh, some of uh, people try to translate it, but it's, it's so difficult. So I will say coming close to elegance by Weldon South, South Cobbling is the uh, most correct uh, interpretation of it uh, or approaching perfection as well. So the, um, the, the purpose of this text, of this uh, quasi dictionary text was to fix language and terminology and names in in a specific uh, period of Chinese history, which is uh, more or less the Han Dynasty uh, period, uh, which uh, um, determined a sort of a unification of the monarchy and of the Chinese state after uh, many centuries of division between like warring states in China. So um, apart from uh, coins or measures or whichever difference they those states had, uh, we also had um, we the Chinese monarchy need to unify the language as well. 
So this is like a little bit summary on the ARIA text. Uh, as I told you, like chapter one to three uh, are quite ancient and chapters four to 19 are the so-called thematic, um, thematic uh, chapters, for example, we see we can see there are like on kinship terms, on architecture, on uh, tools, on music, and also we have like uh, on grasses, on trees, on animals, and we will focus on chapter eight, which is called on heaven or on uh, explaining heaven, I would say, astronomical, meteorological, and calendrical terms. So let's start from Tian Tian is a term in Chinese that means like, nowadays means day or uh, sky, we can say, uh, but originally like the, the most ancient form of this character represented like a man with his arm widespread and something above his head. So Tian like to, we can say that is something above us. So you can comprehend this, both the sky, the sun, the moon, the stars, and all the celestial bodies. Uh, so hemerology, meteorology, and astronomy are deeply connected in, with this uh, term, Tien. And, and of course, uh, I was saying like hemerology and calendrical term because observing the sky was the best technique of timekeeping. So we have both like stargazing and at the same time, timekeeping. Those two concepts were very, very uh, intertwined in ancient China. Um, so the season and variations of Tian during the year uh, were accurately cataloged with calendars. We have like a lot, a lot of uh, ancient calendars and a lot of text that deals with the uh, with the time passing and all the terms and the terminology and the names, the very precise name that um, we need to understand the passing of time. So stars and celestial bodies can, that can be seen at night are different based on the time of the year. It's quite uh, simple to understand, but it's, it's, it was the only way to calculate the passing of time. Um, so let's, let's, have a look on, on, this, on this chapter. So this chapter, I try to divide this chapter in 11 thematic groups. It's quite, uh, it's, it's a rather short chapter compared to other chapters. So we have only 47 glosses and those 47 glosses can be divided into 11 uh, thematic groups. For example, as you, as you can see, uh, by the number the, of the glosses, we uh, have a very heterogeneous uh, distribution of those glosses. And I uh, put in bold uh, font the names of stars, which is the eighth thematic group, because we have 15 glosses, is the by far the largest group in the in this in this chapter. And I also highlighted the last three. Um, the last three groups, because as we can see, they are somehow not uh, closely related to the first part of the chapters. Because uh, we can we can we can have a look. We have heaven and season blessings, as in like good omens, disasters, as in bad omens, heavenly stem and earthly branches, which I will uh, explain in a, in a little while, the name of the years, the name of the months, winds and rains, and the name of, of the stars. So after that, we have the name of rites and sacrifices, hunts and military operations, flags and banners. This one is really a wild, uh, a wild uh, pitch, actually. So, um, uh, there is a lot of speculation uh, regarding the last three, uh, uh, the last three uh, thematic groups, and a lot of uh, people think um, that they might belong to a different textual stratum or even to a lost chapter called uh, "Explaining Rise," but it's just speculative. We don't, we don't know. So I just want to, before uh, to delve into the text, uh, um, I just want to uh, to <laughs> uh, advise you that there will be uh, a lot of specific uh, terminology in uh, in Chinese uh, early Chinese astronomy, and I want to tell you that uh, there are like 
very, very specific terminology regarding the distribution of stars in the sky. So uh, the map of the sky, which we will see in a while, I'm sorry, uh, has a very, very, very specific and precise terminology. We can say that uh, in the Chinese, er in early Chinese sky, we have 28 mansions, uh, as in house, uh, in the sky, which are identified by different names. So those mansions are um, comparable to our constellations or um, an asterism, uh, because like a constellation and asterism is not the same thing. Like a constellation is like a, a big is it can be made up, uh, made uh, by asterism. For example, the Big Dipper is an asterism, while the Ursa Major is the constellation because the the, the, the Big Dipper is just a part of the of the constellation. And apart from uh, uh, the twenty eight mention, we will see also the twelve station the station of uh, Jupiter, actually. So we will see that Jupiter uh, is in different position during a month. So uh, each of those 12 uh, positions that Jupiter occupies in the sky is called a station, a station. It's, uh, and, and yes, so I, I just wanted to introduce those terminology which, which will be uh, quite useful in uh, a couple of minutes. So let's start like heaven and season. You see, like the cerulean vault is what we identify as heaven. So like uh, this is like the the topic, the main topic of the of the chapter. And the first thing that the the anonymous author, the Arya, says to us is like spring is called cerulean sky. So he brings up alternative names for seasons. No, and I. Uh, color the season according to the color uh, in traditional in 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 early chinese tradition so the green the red the vermilion the white and the dark uh, so spring is called cerulean sky summer is called splendor sky uh, autumn is called merciful sky and winter is called upper sky these are the four seasons you know? um, and then we start talking about blessings so like an ideal year no, so how can we uh, understand if this year is a good year, is like a, um, a blissful year? So in spring, there is an azure arousal. In summer, a vermilion brightness. In autumn, a white maintenance. In winter, a pure darkness. If these four climates are harmonious, the period is known as jade candle. And there is a lot of speculation on this uh, <laughs> terminology, you know, why jade candle also, like, uh, like a, can a candle is a source of light and jade is like the, the most precious of stones. So if all the season are regulated, we have a, um, the year is called jade candle. And then there is another kind of description. Spring is the season when crops come into life, summer when crops grow and are plentiful. Autumn when crops are ripe and harvested. Winter when crops are quiet and still. If the four seasons are harmonious and regular, the period is known as sunny wind. It means that peaceful and tranquil winds will blow. And when sweet rain timely descends, this is a, a, a topos <laughs> in Chinese early literature, and the myriad creatures are in exceptional shape, the period is known as luscious water. This means good weather for the crops and wind is regulated and rain is benevolent. On the other end, we have the disaster. If cereal do not ripe, it is known as famine. If, if vegetables do not ripe, it is known as dearth. If fruit, fruits do not ripe, it is known as shortage. If famine persists, then it's known as persistent starvation. So the disaster in this, mm, in this in this text are related to the crop failure basically not like uh, earthquakes or i don't know like uh, meteorites or whatsoever so the the disaster are related to the uh, to the crop failure so this the the right cycle of um of seasons and and we have the first way to calculate uh, time and this is maybe it's quite famous, but I will introduce it for, for those who, who are not uh, familiar with that. Is the 
uh, heavenly stems and earthly branches system. So we have in uh, traditional uh, Chinese thought, we have 10 heavenly stems and 12 earthly branches. If we combine those uh, uh, 10 plus uh, 12 uh, characters, we create a cycle of 60 different years. So, uh, so if we combine the first, for example, Jia the, and Yin, for example, this is one year, and the next year will be the Yi, uh, Yi Luan, for example, Yi Mao, and then the, the Bing Chen and, and, and so on. So there is a, the combination of 10 plus 12, and at the end of the 10, we have a sort of a discrepancy with the, the first 12. So we'll start a different kind of, of, of cycle. And with all the possible combination between those uh, heavenly stems and earthly branches, we had 60 different, um, 60 different uh, names for years. So a cycle of 60 years, after a cycle of 60 years, the uh, heavenly stems and earthly branches restart from the first uh, combination. So it, it might seem it's easier to, to understand it rather than to explain it, I'm sorry. But uh, yes, there is like the, in relation to Jupiter, the first heavenly stem is called Yampang, the second is called Jomong, etc. So we have like different and specific astronomical names for uh, this uh, 60 years cycle. Um, I didn't translate all of it because it's just like very, very specific terms for each of these heavenly stems and earthly branches. Um, this is more interesting. So we, we talk about like this sway, this Tai sway actually is the name of Jupiter because as I, I already told you, uh, Jupiter, the, the time, uh, like a, a, a Jupiter, I don't know what is the adjective, but a year on Jupiter is almost 12 uh, earthly years. So basically uh, the, the year was segmented into 12 different, 12 different uh, kind of years. And, uh, and so when, when Jupiter made a, a complete revolution around the sun, the cycle of 12 uh, years will start again. No? So that's why Jupiter, like Tai Sui, this Sui, this, this character, and nowadays means year. No? So when it's like, uh, how old are you? And they say like, I, I am 32 years old, or I am 32 Sui old. No? So this is, Jupiter became the, 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 the symbol for year. And, and this is just like the, the explanation that, in different times, in different generations, different dynasties, the the way of calculate a year was uh, was different. So in this during the Xia Dynasty, it was used uh, Jupiter. No, the time that it takes Jupiter to move from one sidereal station to the next. During Shan Dynasty, uh, the time between the two sacrifices, and in Zhou Dynasty, dynasty, um, the time between two harvests. So the concept of year changed during the, the different eras now. And we have also like the name of the months, which is basically the same uh, thing uh, we had for um, years. Then we have a description of winds and, uh, and, and rains. Uh, I will not, I will just pass very quickly. And there are like different kind of atmospherical phenomenon. But they are all related to the the four directions, and uh, and different intensity of winds and on or rain. If someone is interested, I can share this to you. But let's uh, go to the final, the most important uh, thing in this presentation, this talk, which is the 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 name of the stars, so that the celestial map. This is like the, a summary of the things I've already told you, like the twelve stations and the 28 mansions no? so this is like a scheme of the of the of the sky in uh, in ancient china we have four quadrants each one is representative of one direction so we have the the white tiger for the west the vermilion bird in the south the azure dragon in the east and the uh, the dark warrior or the black tortoise in the north and in each of these quadrants we have seven 
so 28, so seven for each direction, uh, seven mansions, no? which are based on the movement of the moon in one sidereal month rather than the movement of the sun in one tropical year, which is the our constellations now, right? Um, so this is the map with all the, uh, the mansions, the 28 mansion in the sky, which are the, the red dots. As we can see, there are more uh, asterism and constellation, but the most important, the ones that identify the, the, the mansion where the uh, the ones that are in red dots and all of them have a very common names they have like there is the girl the ox the rooftop the house um the ghost the horn the neck so they are like very very common names They're, they they don't have like a a legend behind it like in in the in the in our constellation so they are very very plain and simple names and they are related to the transposition of earthly life into the sky so the more we go to the center of the of the of the sky the more we have like the fixed star for example polaris and the north star and and they are representative of the imperial court and the more we get to the periphery to the outskirts of the sky we have the more humble and basic uh, constellations of mansions. And that's it. And that's uh, some of the examples of these uh, asterism and constellations. So uh, the station of everlasting star, which is the name of a station, is in the horn and neck mansions. Heavenly root is another name for the root mansion. So those mansions have also popular names, or like very, um, we can say vulgar names. So I put like in green, the name of stations in red, the name of um, mansions and in light blue, the alternative name. Heveling Quadriga is another name for the room mansion and the great celestial body of the room, heart and tail mansion combined together. The station of big fire is another name for the great celestial body. So this is just like a, some kind of mapping of the sky. You know? And that's it. Uh, for example, we can identify here the Milky Way, which is called as the Ford, the Hun Ford, the bridge and Ford of the Milky Way, which is in the, the splitting wood station, which is situated between the winnowing basket mansion and the deeper mansion. You know? For example, we have Altair, which is called the Ox Herder, the Herder, you know, which is in the southern deeper mansion. And, and also in the deeper mansion, we had in the Ox mansion, we have Vega, the brightest star, uh, one of the brightest star of the sky, which is the lady uh, of the, there is a very, very famous uh, tale of the Herder, Altair and Vega, the, the, the suing maiden, now we can, which it's a very, very famous Chinese tale. Um, also, we have the Pleiades. The Pleiades are in the, the Great Girder station in the main mansion. So the main mansion, the main probably is the main of the tiger, the white tiger, because it, it's in the west. And we can see in this in this image, with it's a sort of like a, a very, very uh, strange, like a W and a lot of uh, strange, uh, strange and, and dots and stars, which are the Pleiades. We, it's, very important. One of the very first stars that were observed in the night sky. Um, also, there are some, the, the area skips a lot of mansions actually, and, and starts to tell us the star, some stars description. For example, the polar star is also called the Northern Celestial Body, the Beji, the extreme north. And, and here they're talking about the river drum, which is another name for Altair. So, we have to return back. So basically, maybe this passage belongs to a different stratum. And also, the, the aria uh, concludes this, this thematic group with some observation, like one planet observation, the radiant golden star or metal star, which is Venus, is also called the unfolding brightness uh, star. So because of like the, 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 the morning star, no, right? The, the, the bringing of light star. And, and also comets are also known as sharpened spearhead and meteor as fastened planet. 
So we can say like as a summary, the out of the total, the 12 Jupiter station, we, we, we can also, we can only find nine station out of the 28, we can only find 17 and out of the five planets, we, we can only find one, which is Venus. Are we dealing with an incomplete chapter? Maybe. Why is some information missing? And there is a lot of speculation here as well. A lot of people say like, maybe they skip them on purpose or maybe when the area was compiled they didn't have uh, very developed star maps as in in the Han dynasty so like for example Wofu which is a um, uh, which studied the area a lot which is a uh, he says like in in Zhou dynasty in Qin dynasty uh, they didn't have all the star maps the, the very accurate star maps so they skipped a lot of the mansions, the planets, and the stations. And, and the RER goes on with the Michelin automatic groups. So for example, they start to talk about like the, the spring sacrifice, the, the summer sacrifice, as well as the spring hunt, the summer hunt, etc. So uh, I hope we I stir some curiosity on the, the, the system, uh, the, the astronomical system in, in early China, of course. The aria was uh, was quite um, is classified as a very ancient text. So um, after the aria, a lot of more more precise more precise texts were 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 compiled with, and they and they completed the, the star map of it. So, but I just wanted to to show you one of the most ancient and. Uh, attempt at describing the sky and with all its nomenclature. Thank you very much. And today, I just wanted to point out that today we had like this the space spacecraft uh, was launched by the Chinese government. And they say like that the the, the, um, the the relationship between Chinese and the sky is very strong <laughs> nowadays as well. Thank you very much. Thank you, Federico, for this. Uh very insight uh, on Chinese astronomy and thank you for this uh, lively, very lively paper. So uh, I think we have uh, quite a lot of time for questions. So uh, I remind you our rules. So I post them in the chat again. So write uh, in the chat uh, if uh, you have a question or a follow-up. So we have uh, Divya with a question. So uh, Divya, would you like to unmute yourself and ask her the question directly? Okay, sure. Thank you, Federico. So am I audible? Yes. Okay. Okay. So thank you so much for such a lovely talk. It was very interesting and I'm new to the field. So I don't really know much about this field. So but we uh, like kind of uh, thinking of doing an empirical study on how people actually do stargazing and how do they actually come up with these stories on the stars related to the stars. So I was just wondering uh, if you have also done some empirical studies on these lines in China, like on Chinese population. Well, thank you very much. Uh, as I as I told you before, like I'm more, uh, uh, I, I studied a lot about like biology, not astronomy, but there are like a lot of studies, like also empirical studies. I can suggest you to uh, look for um, a book by yeah. Brill, and uh, it was written by uh, the late uh, Yap, uh, what is his name again? It was it's a Dutch astronomer, astrophysic, I think, and uh, uh, Sun Xiaochun. And the title of the book is, let me let me check it for you, yeah, uh, sure. is, um, I can post it, Chinese Sky During the Han. Uh, during, by, during the Han? During the Han, yeah, Han, okay. in, as in Han Dynasty. So by, by Sun Xiaoshun and Yap Kistemacher, yes. Um, this is like, they, they, there is a more, more specific and, uh, and empirical study on, 
on on how those um, celest celestial maps and instruments were uh, put at use uh, during during Han Dynasty, actually. So, like, quite at the time when this book, the Arya, was used as a reference, and it was already written, possibly. So they they made like a further study in order to to improve and and uh, and write those celestial celestial maps. And I, I forgot to tell you that the images that I put on the presentation were not, of course, original. We don't have like real and accurate uh, images and pictures of uh, of that time because like. Um, those were like made in uh, probably in the Ming Dynasty or uh, so. So they're actually like fake uh, images of it. There was like later interpretation of it. But since they were like yeah. some interesting to show how how those how that system was put into the society and was like fixed at some point in history. And so like that's it. I mean, as, as we had the constellations, like they had the mansions and they, 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 they decided to have that kind of uh, celestial division. That's it. Yeah, sure. Thank you very much. Now, I think we have uh, a question from uh, Chris Benner. So, Chris. Please. Yes, I have a question for uh, Frederico. Uh, in the Western constellations, uh, uh, Ewald Termonder, a century ago, uh, put together the star patterns and which stars are reported uh, uh, from the ancient constellations. Uh, and from that, he was able to determine when those constellations uh, were formed and named by looking at the part of the southern sky which is excluded and he came up with a date of somewhere around 2700 BC. Uh, can something like that be done with the Chinese uh, asterisms that are, are recorded there? Uh, or are they always just current? Can you, can you elaborate on the, on the, what we what we done in the in in the west because I, I i think i didn't catch it like what what happened in the west uh it where where you uh are uh where you are on the earth determines what stars you can see uh in the northern hemisphere we can't see the stars in the south and uh and so if you take the constellations that uh that the uh that where that we have from ancient times, uh, you see an area where there are no constellations. There is something called the precession of the equinoxes. Uh, I'm an astronomer, okay. so forgive me if you don't know the term. No, 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 no. I study uh, high school. <laughs> uh, but uh, it means that the pole of the Earth is changing its position, yeah. and it's it's a it's a, a 25, 26 year thousand year uh, cycle. So. Uh, if you if you can uh, determine the area where there are no star patterns or stars, uh, you take the uh, the center of that, and that tells you where the southern pole was at the time that the constellations were asterisms. Um, and uh, and actually, if you take the size of it, you can get the uh, the latitude uh, where they were named. Uh, I'm, I'm wondering, you know, this has been done uh, with, uh, with the constellations that we use in astronomy, uh, and you come up with uh, the, the center pole of the, the south uh, being where it was in 2700 BC. Uh, you find that the, uh, the latitude is somewhere between 36 and 40 degrees, according to Monder, uh, north, uh, which puts it north of Babylon and puts it north mm -hmm. of you know, a lot of the other likely places. Uh, and I'm just wondering if the Chinese with a somewhat different disconnected uh, astronomy, if, uh, if there's enough information there in these ancient texts to do the same well, sort of thing. 
Well, uh, thank you, thank you. Now, now it's 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 clear. Sorry. No, um, the fact is we have like a, um, we have a sort of um, fixing this uh, star maps around maybe from 200 BC to 200 uh, C BCE, 200 CE, and in that in that period of time, it's clear that they identified uh, what's so called like a palace. So I forgot to say that around all the mansions, you know, we have all the 28 mansions, we have a, like a fixed palace. And that palace is like the North Pole, like the, 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 the celestial North Pole with the Polaris and Ursa Minor. And, and that, that is very clear because they call it like the, 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 the Northern extreme, the Beiji. And that is like the, the place where the celestial emperor was residing. And so we have like a sort of, um, we don't have any, any um, clue about like the procession of the equinox because we don't have like, um, we don't have any, any information regarding if the palace moved through, through the Polaris. So we don't have like, like any notion about like, well, the, the palace, the emperor palace, the celestial emperor palace was somewhere else uh, in the past. Because, because of course, like the Arya doesn't talk about the, the, the central palace. It doesn't, it doesn't talk, it, it, it simply talks about the, the, the northern extreme, which is like a sort of like the polar, we, we can understand that is the Polaris, but we don't have any information about like some, some kind of like a fixed and uh, non non mentioned sky, as 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 in as in like uh, uh, constellation less sky. So we have like this 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 northern extreme, which is uh, we can identify, but we don't have any other clue. So the, all the information we have about like the 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 the, the, the fixed stars in the north uh, celestial poles are from like two hundred BC onward so we don't have any information about like uh, nothing going farther back no 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 that's why i i picked this text because this text is one of the most ancient ones like i mean traditionally speaking and it's very terse and he doesn't it, it talks about some like 17 out of 28 mentions so not even like the old whole 28 and he doesn't talk we need we need like some we have like uh, some commentary regarding these precise things, but it, it happened like in 300 uh, CE. So like yeah. almost 500 years later. So yes, we don't and have it takes any clue. Several hundred years before you even notice the, the motion. Sure, that's why like thousands of years, yeah. Thank you. Thank you, thank you for the question. Now I think that's uh, Hamune. Amuna, please unmute yours. Hello, everybody. Thank you. Thank you to both speakers for the interesting presentations. I have a question for uh, Vilus. Vilus, nice to see you. <laughs> um, uh, well, I was really convinced about your uh, argu uh, arguments, yeah, and I think that your doubts about um, the validity of um, Kumas um, theory uh, are well-founded and um yeah i was surprised that uh, uh the naming of the planets is still uh, well, not settled by the times of <laughs> plato um and here comes my question um as you were wondering about possible functions um especially regarding to jupiter and saturn um have you considered uh um perhaps for uh, the platonic academy the agricultural um theories of i don't know stellar constellations um and their uh, 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 yeah influence on um uh, on nature or on crops on um you know agriculture just in general because um i don't know when jupiter appears in a certain time as we uh, we've seen also in the chinese tradition it's a good sign and it's a benevolent um planet um it has a uh, uh, Features that are just very, um, um, how to say, um, 
well, there is a reason for naming him Jupiter or Zeus, um, as he's benevolent and um, how to say just uh, gives life and um, uh, prosperity to uh, the people. So, yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for your question. Well, uh, there are no um, associations in terms of astronomical names with the agricultural dis dysfunction, right? So I haven't seen at least um, any text in, in, in Platonist tradition. Perhaps there are, and I would be, I would really be interested in, in, in looking into them. The only, um, the only theory about these two names so far that was so put forward, I think it was by René Bragg, he claimed, so it is a very elaborate um, argument. In the Timaeus, uh, Uranus is synonymous to the word cosmos. And in the eponymous, the fixed stars is cosmos, which is synonymous also to Uranus. And then we have Uranus, Kronos, and Zeus. So we have a nice theogonic succession. And that's why, that's why they have these three names. This is his uh, theory and his proposal, which is, uh, well, it sounds nice, but I don't really see how people could just come up with <laughs> such, a, such a progression in the middle of other progression, which is Hermes, uh, Aphrodite, and, and, and Aries. Uh, so this is the only alternative so far. And well, thank you. I mean, um, I will try to look forward, look into this, uh, in, into this uh, suggestion. Perhaps I may, I may find some something. But then again, I mean, if we, if there, if we, if we are thinking about agricultural function, then Demeter would be a far better candidate <laughs> to be a planet than 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 Kronos. But yes, thank you. I, I mean, I will try. I will try. I will think about it. Thanks. So I think we have a follow-up on a previous topic by Francesca Puglia. So Francesca, would you like to elaborate on your follow-up? And then we might... Okay, thank you. It was just a very brief uh, comment on the, on, the, on the previous question. And uh, it was just to say that I've recently seen that there was actually a, an, ancient, uh, an ancient map with the, um, with the name of dimensions, and it was dated around the 4th century BC, but it's uh, um, an excavated artifact which is not really precise and not really clear, but it should refer, uh, like the, um, the representation should refer to the 28 dimensions. Uh, so we are actually pretty sure that uh, they already use this kind of uh, classification of, uh, of constellations, but of course it's not as clear as uh, Ming Dynasty maps or uh, later maps in general. And uh, about the, the precision, I think that is uh, clear when it, uh, reg uh, when it comes about um, the pole star, because we know that there was this, uh, this change in the, in the pole star, and at the time it was uh, Kochab. And um, therefore, I think it, uh, I, I haven't read the studies in which this, uh, um, this kind of study has, uh, has been uh, um, examined or proposed, but I think that is emerged from the, um, from the change in the, in the pole star. Thank, thank, thank you, Francesca. No, I, was, I, I wrote to you like, how, how do they call it? I mean, what, it, what is the term to identify Kochab? In this moment, I don't remember okay. in, the, in the garment the name, uh, but because I, I probably it's, uh, it's represented the deeper, but not the pole star. I mm -hmm. should check. Maybe I will let you know if, uh, when no, if I there is anything it. written about it, because like, I mean, Beidi is like a sort of interchangeable term, like the extreme yes. north. So it's very, it's very easy to, to assign it to another star when that star became like the, 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 the polar star somehow. Yes, and, and sometimes it's not even associated to a star. I mean, uh, you find texts in which uh, you, you read that uh, it uh, slightly moves, and sometimes you find texts which it says that it's completely immovable, and probably it's just referring to the, to the pole, but not to the star associated to the pole. So I think it's a bit complicated to understand which one uh, it is. But I think that uh, in the garment, there is a representation of, uh, of the deeper in the, um, in the middle. And then you have the... Um, the, the names for the mentions. So it actually works as a kind of uh, very simple map of the sky.
No, you made. I'm sorry. Can, can I can I uh, follow up a little bit because you made me think about. Yes. Um, I didn't. I didn't stop too much on on, on that because there is like a, like one uh, alternative name for the Pleiades was the Western route, but there is another. There is a place which is close to Polaris, but it's not. It's like in the mansion that goes towards Polaris, um, which is the which is called the emptiness mansion and that and that mansion can be called also the northern route so it's so like the, the 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 route that goes north something like i don't know if it can be related it would be interesting to see if that even coca was in into the close to the to the emptiness mansion to the, the void mansion which is quite, quite for sure curious. at that moment was closer than uh, than polaris to the to, to the empty point, which I think might be referred to the to the North Pole itself, maybe. Okay. And I think that the, that the closest star at that time was uh, Kohab and not um, not Polaris. Yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah. No, no, so just... it might be referred to to that. So um, I, I I think Wimuna has. Uh, as another follow up on, on videos, or you have you want, okay. Uh, well, uh, videos may um, I can um, maybe I can elaborate on my follow up before giving the word to Christian Tolsa. Uh, you can probably watch for uh, Mula Pin. Since uh, the last section of uh, uh, this uh, Babylonian tre treatise uh, deals with uh, astrometeorological climate. And so each planet is associated with uh, a special weather condition. And so um, your functional your fun functional translation model can be confirmed with uh, such uh, an interesting material. So it's a suggestion. I'm not uh, uh, an expert on uh, Babylonian <laughs> astrometeorology, but maybe you can uh, check. Uh, later so uh thank you without further ado i leave the word to christian christian would you mind unmuting yes yourself? hi um well thanks to both of you they, they were maybe very interesting presentations both of them um i have a question for both i think although well um, I am very ignorant on, on the Chinese side, so perhaps the Greek thing will be more interesting. I don't know. Uh, so for, for Vilnius, I, I wanted to, uh, to, to ask you whether you have considered uh, comparing the situation with the uh, ancient Egyptian names of the planets. So in Egypt, as far as I know, there is a kind of late tradition, which is uh, more or less clearly uh, derived from the Babylonian one, or at least that's what people say, although, well, it's of course a matter of investigation. Um, but there are also much older names. Um, for example, um, Saturn is called Orus, the bull of, of heaven. Uh, Jupiter is, is called uh, Horus, the uh, Horus of the two lands. Um, that's Jupiter, which seems to carry a political uh, political meaning, which could be more or less well related to Marduk, who is the the, Babylon, the, the main Babylonian uh, supra political authority, so to speak. And then there is course of the horizon, which would be Mars. And this could be more or less linked with uh, some epithets of Nergal. And then, um, by the way, uh, so this bull of heaven um, 
is also an epithet of Ninurta in the Babylonian tradition, although the, this epithet, I think it, it uh, appears in, in other religious texts applied to other uh, divine figures. So I, I think that's an, well, an interesting place to compare in order to see or to distinguish between these two possibilities, which you outlined very well. So whether it's a direct transmission or an adaptation, or, there, or, uh, or whether uh, there are certain observable characteristics like Jupiter, the, the, mm, the brightest one and the most regular, so to speak, from the most visible ones in the sense that it makes this 12-year uh, cycle as, as in Chinese astronomy, which is an important cycle also in, in the Greek tradition. And the, the red planet Mars, so it's, it's logical, it's a, a, a god of violence and war, perhaps. So, and then you have this Heracles thing, which is related to that, actually. But um, I think it's also interesting to, to consider whether, uh, consider more options. Um, so, for example, you, you haven't mentioned the possibility that, 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 that there was a, an, an astronomical tradition going westward from, from Babylon, Babylon via the Persian Empire and the Ionian colonies. I mean, in 5th century Athens and perhaps late 6th century, you have astronomers working. Uh, there are many of them coming from the Greek colonies in the East, so from the point of view of Greece. And uh, they seemingly uh, inherited cycles from Babylon, although of of course, it's also a question whether they discovered these cycles by themselves or not, because they don't say it, right? But I think, well, maybe one can compare with the zodiac, right? I think the, the zodiac in, in the Greek speaking world does not appear until Hellenistic or late Hellenistic times. And it's not philosophers who, uh, who, who give names. Uh, but uh, it's astrologers, right? So, so I understand the uh, it's it's a it's a very nice uh, possibility that these could come from the academia. But I think when and and as you say, it's of course a, a working argument. It's not uh, it's not conclusive. But I think uh, one could um, fruitfully compare with uh, on the one side alterations which might be related to Babylon, like Egypt and also to consider more actors. Sorry, it was not a question. I feel I'm talking too much. <laughs> no, 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 this is wonderful. Um, two things. One thing is that that is still puzzling me and I still can't really handle it. I mean, we have this, this very first text that, that I showed you in the Timaeus where Plato mm -hmm. gives a name to Hermes, right? So if there were, and there probably sh should be uh, some astronomers working uh, in Athens during that time, why he does not give other names? I mean, if he knows those names, why just uh, specify Hermes, right? What is so special about that? And why, why call uh, Aphrodite or Venus the dawn bearer instead of giving a religious name? So this is still puzzling me why he does that. I mean, or why he doesn't do something else I mean, when in fact, just one generation, it's just a few years almost, uh, later, you you have you have something so, something entirely else. But what I wanted to ask you then, um, does, so is there a complete correspondence between the Egyptian uh, names and the Babylonian names in terms of function? Well, I mean, no, not exactly, but but uh, it's it's the same thing. Well, in in Greek, it's closer, but I think you can ascribe this very simply to the fact that the panthe pantheons don't match each other. I mean. Even if you wanted to, you could not give a complete correspondence between the two, right? So, so I see there is ambiguity in this argument. Mm. Okay. Yeah, I will. I will definitely look into. It, but, but perhaps could you recommend any sort of a, you know secondary literature for, for 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 these sort of questions? Because this is one of the things that I'm struggling with. I mean, and they are not so much so much about about it the, oh, about that's... the history of transmission of of these of these terms. Um, I, I have very few thoughts about it <laughs> because in Egypt, uh, I think there is only Quack who has spoken about this. I don't know if you know the, the author, Joachim Quack, I think. And um, 
I will, if you give me your, your email or if this, I, I can give you um, a reference about the Babylonian tradition on the planet. I think it's called Astronomy and Astrology in Babylon, something like this, but I don't remember the name of the author. And um, so what else? Uh, yeah, I, sorry, I wanted also to, to ask uh, Federico about this precisely. I, I don't know if I missed it, I'm sorry, but uh, do they figure in the area the named of the planets, or at least for Venus, which uh, I think you said it's the only planet uh, which appears there? Because as far as, as I know, uh, there is, or at least not as clearly, the tradition, the theophoric tradition uh, of the planets. So the, the tradition of assigning planets to divine figures in China, but perhaps I'm wrong. Uh, for example, in Babylon, this is not uh, very well known. You you find that in that book, which I will write to you about. So in Babylon, there are also non-theophoric names for the planets. Uh, for example, Salvatano is, is Nergal, and actually in the treatises they appear more often. But um, we know the, the the divine names only. Yeah, the problem is, thank you for the question, but the problem is we don't have like the concept of gods. Like, I mean, not okay. in the way we have in the West. So it's it's so difficult to compare the two things. But, but, but if I may, um, when you talk about like the, the thing, like the, the horoscope and the astrology moving from Babylon to the West, it's it, a lot of people are talking about like that he moved also toward East. I mean, there are a lot of inter like in intertwined between like uh, maybe not Babylon, but Persian, of course, Pers Persia and China are so, so close related in, in, in a lot of points in history, even, even regarding terminology. So there is like, as I'm very, very interested and in, in fascinated by um, um, glottogenesis, uh, a lot of Chinese terms, especially like uh, uh, disyllable, like two syllable words are not, a lot of them are not like Chinese born terms. So some of them are like, probably arise from Persia. I definitely arrive from Persia, some of them. For example, olive uh, or other things. And it would be interesting to compare, since there are a lot of hints of Babylonian astronomy in Chinese astronomy, especially like the the, sex, the 60 years uh, procession of years and all other things. And a lot of people already talked about that in literature. Um, it would be interesting to compare phonologically as well, because a lot of things like Chinese, Chinese works in that way, a lot of things that cannot understand or cannot uh, put, in, put it well in the language are directly transliterated or transphonemized into Chinese. And the fact is, like the vast majority of uh, calendrical, hemerological terms in Arya are not trans completely non translatable into Chinese. Like they, 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 they they don't make any sense, like blocking simplicity or I don't know, like there are a lot of them and it's maybe there can be some even phonological hints, not from the point of view of planets, but uh, uh, um, from the point of view of, of time, the passing of time, because planets are more like, like, you know, like Jupiter, like Venus, we talk about Venus, like the bearer of light, is the same like the the, the Qingming, and and also like the or the golden, the golden or the metal planet, and then also we have um, we have Jupiter, which is the yearly planet, like because it it defined the concept of the passing of time. It's so important Jupiter for that, and we don't have in the Arya, but in other sources we have Mars, which is the Yin Huo. Uh, which means like something it's 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 a pun it's a paranomasia actually because if you can see like like campfire uh, doubting campfire literally but it means also something that is blurry and reddish as fire in the sky 
and Mars appears in the, um, if I'm not saying, I don't remember the mansion, but in the mansion where Antares is. So the Scorpio the constellation and Antares, which is also red and sometimes they have like Antares and Mars and it's a bad omen as well. It's represented as a bad omen, like the death of the emperor or something like that. So th there is not like a theophoric transposition of the names, but there is like a sort of paranom paranomasia uh, for the name of the planet. For example, Mercury, um, Hermes, like uh, it, it's related to the height of like the, um, the time of the day in which he appears in the sky, like Chen Shi is Mercury or, or yeah. So there are like other, other, other ways to identify the planet, but I will, I'm so curious in like, if I, if I had like the, the Babylonian names of, <laughs> of the, the sex, the 60 years cycle, it would be so, so funny to, for, to, for me to, to compare them to, the ones we have in the aria. Thank you, Thank you for this question and uh, for this answer uh, to both uh, Bilius and uh, Francesco. Uh, so, uh, are there any questions? Otherwise, since uh, time is up. Uh, let me uh, thank you, all the speakers, the speakers, all the participants in this uh, very um, insightful discussion. I hope to see you for the uh, last seminar of uh, this cycle, this astronomy and astrology cycle on the on the 25th of uh, June, uh, Friday, Friday the 25th, and not uh, on uh, Tuesday. So please uh, remind this uh, little change uh, in our schedule. If everything is up, I, um, I will, I would like to thank again uh, the, all uh, all of you, and I think uh, yeah we can uh, have a nice uh, time night time, and we can elaborate on these uh, wonderful sessions on uh, on sky, and perhaps we can also uh, have some observation of our night sky, so. Please have a nice uh, night and see you next Friday. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Federico and Willis. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye, everyone.